Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Okay, imagine this. You're in a band. Say you're the, uh, you're the singer, and things are going pretty good. You know, songs and gigs and tours and groupies and drugs and the whole works. But after a while, you realize that you've started to look at music differently. You have some new ideas, and you would like to explore certain new directions. But what if these new ideas don't really fit in with what the band is all about? What if everybody in the group doesn't share your vision of what should come next? And what if you feel really, really strongly about following this particular musical muse? Wow, you get fractures and tension and confusion. This happens a lot when people who exist to make music have more music to make than the other people with whom they've been making this music to that point. So two things can happen. The band can break up using the ever-popular creative differences issue, or they can reach some kind of accommodation so the keener can go off and get everything out of his or her system and then come back and get down to the business of being part of a team, part of this band. Okay? Sometimes this works. Sometimes it doesn't. This is what happens when someone in a band says, Screw you guys. I'm going solo. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Morrissey, one of the more successful solo forays in the history of modern rock. The Smiths exploded in the fall of 1987, and just months later, Morrissey appears as a solo artist, and he's been making records on his own ever since. Welcome again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is a show all about splits and detours and purges. It's the concept of going solo, the causes, the motivations, and the results. Where things go right, and where they go terribly wrong. Now, the way I see it, there are three reasons why someone would like to leave the safe confines of a band and strike out on their own. Number one, someone in the group wants to do something that's not necessarily in line with what the group is all about. In fact, it may be contrary to the band's overall vision and image. But this person has all this material, all these musical ideas, and he or she needs to get it out of their system before it has a deleterious effect on the group as a whole. So between tours and albums, they take a little sabbatical to pursue their individual muses. Once purged and cleansed, they're free to return to the safety of the group and pick up where they left off. That's number one. Number two, the person in question wants a little extra recognition of their talents. Instead of continuing to be seen as a part of a whole, a team, a group, they would like to be known as an individual artist. Sometimes they come back to the band, sometimes they don't. And number three, the band or the relationship with the rest of the band blows up. Things go to hell, and the individual is left to pick up the pieces. Hey, screw the band, man. I'm striking out on my own. It'll be my own show. I'll call the shots. I know what I'm doing. Now, what we're going to do is go over examples of all three situations before we're done. Let's begin by looking at Tom York. As a member of Radiohead, he had a lot of different obligations and pressures some of which resulted in occasionally paralyzing cases of stage fright and writer's block. But when the band ended up at the end of their record deal, they became free agents. And with all kinds of cash, I mean, let's face it, Radiohead doesn't have to worry about their pension fund, they decided to explore the free agent market. You know, take their time before they commit to another label. Meanwhile, Tom was a little restless. He's one of those guys who always has to keep making music. He had already made a series of guest appearances with other groups like a Drugstore and Uncle and Sparkle Horse. He worked with PJ Harvey, and he worked as part of a fictional group, Venus and Furs, on the Velvet Goldmine soundtrack back in 1999. Oh, and did I mention his heavy involvement in Radiohead's official website? In other words, I guess what I'm trying to say here is Tom is a bit of a workaholic, so when Radiohead decided to take their time between albums, Tom went to work on his own record. The Eraser album was constructed from bits and pieces gathered off the floor during various writing sessions. For example, when Tom found some sounds while messing around in a hotel room while on tour with Radiohead, he would just store them on his laptop for future use. Eventually, he and Radiohead producer Nigel Godrich started sorting through these accumulated bits. They arranged them into pieces of music, and melodies were written over top. 
Sure, it was mostly computer-generated stuff, and it was very minimalist, but you know what? It sounded pretty cool. And then, to Tom's surprise, he found that these instrumental pieces lent themselves to lyrics. So he wrote some, and then added the vocals. Bit of drums and guitar later, and voila, an unexpected solo album. And the record did pretty well. This is the title track. Tom York, taking a sabbatical from his day job as singer with Radiohead. That's The Eraser, the title track of his extracurricular project. Now, Radiohead is okay, just that Tom, you know, got restless. Then there's the case of Scott Weiland. The Stone Temple Pilots were a terrific band. Great songs, great albums, and Weiland is an awesome frontman and singer. If you've ever seen him perform live, you will know how mesmerizing this dude is on stage. At the same time, Scott's personal life has always been, um, well, in a state of flux, which created some challenges for the rest of the Stone Temple Pilots. You know, there were the drugs, the car accidents, the rehab, the jail, the domestic issues, all that stuff. Things were especially bad for Scott and the band in 1997. After 13 trips to rehab, STP played a show in Toronto that most people thought would be their last. Following the show, three-quarters of the band and Wyland parted ways. The other three guys formed a group called Talk Show, and Wyland went solo. It was time for a break. It really was. No one wanted to say it was a permanent thing, but it was acknowledged that it was time for everyone to step back from STP and, you know, sort things out creatively, musically, physically, mentally, and uh, legally. This provided for some nice drama. In one corner, the three guys from the Stone Temple Pilots. In the other, they were embattled, drug-addicted lead singer. Now, artistically, the winner in this battle was Scott Weiland. I mean, it wasn't even close. While Talk Show demonstrated that they were a uh, merely competent rock band, Weiland's record showed that he had something, that something, that made STP special. Weiland's solo album was called 12 Bar Blues. It was released on May 17, 1998, and producing it was Canadian Daniel Lanois. This is a fascinating record. It highlighted Weiland's commands of sounds and textures and instruments beyond just the electric guitar. This is stuff that he could not get away with in STP. All kinds of guest musicians were brought in, including people like Cheryl Crow. She was brought in to play, of all things, the accordion. This wasn't STP, but it sure as hell was interesting. When 12 Bar Blues was released in mid-May of 1998, Wyland had been clean and sober for about six months. He was also freely talking about his problems, including the much-repeated quote that he had spent over $6 million on various drugs between 1994 and early 1998. He appeared to have it together. But then he was busted again for drugs on June 1st of 1998, and that was pretty much the close of his solo career. Meanwhile, Talk Show, the band featuring the other three members of Stone Temple Pilots, was a disaster. And a year later, what a surprise, STP was brought back together with Wyland out front. They lasted through two more albums before everything finally fell apart for good. Wyland, of course, later serviced in Velvet Revolver, and they've, you know, done okay. Wyland seems to be in good shape, too, as far as the drugs go. Meanwhile, the guys in Stone Temple Pilots have a new project called Army of Anyone. We'll see how they do. Then there's the case of John Frusciante of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. In the midst of a Japanese tour in May of 1998, a smacked up, coked up, messed up John quit the band. And for the next couple of years, he worked really, really hard at being the worst heroin junkie, or perhaps it should be the best heroin junkie, he could possibly be, thanks to a very strong self-destructive streak and a helpful dealer who had a line on a particularly pure variety of Persian smack from Afghanistan. John disappeared from the Chili Peppers for about five years. During that time, however, he continued to make music, and some of his stuff came out on solo records. There were two CDs during this particular time in the wilderness. And even after he was welcomed back into the Chili Peppers, John continued to make music on his own. See, he's one of those guys who just lives to make music and record music. He needs to be in a studio. It's therapeutic, 
spiritually necessary and really the thing that provides structure in his life. Here's Flea talking about John in the studio. I mean, he's a very musical guy and he worked really hard on on, on the study of synthesizers and the study of, of background harmonies, you know, f from like pop groups from the 60s and doo-wop groups from the 50s and um, something that he's very, uh, was really into doing. And you know, who's gonna try to hold down some guy that's got all this music in him that wants to come out? And now here's John. To me, it's creating things that's really, that's really my favorite, you know, part of, of the whole, uh, you know, being in the music business, it's it's the creating part of it. You know, the the going on tour and promoting part of it. I just consider it it's my job, and I'm happy to do it. You know, but but uh, for me, my my real true love will always be the writing of music and the recording of music. In 2004 alone, John issued four full CDs and one EP. Let's hear something from one of those. This album was called Shadows Collide with People. The track is called Regret. John Frusciante, guitarist with the Chili Peppers and a guy who has so much music in him, that he can fill albums and albums and albums with his own stuff. When we come back, we'll look at people who went solo because, uh, well, they didn't have much of a choice. You'll see what I mean in a second. Welcome back, I'm Alan Cross, and we're looking at the notion of solo records. Sometimes it's a good idea. Sometimes it's, it's not. And sometimes, well, you just don't have a choice because the band you used to be in just blew up. And let's face it, as a rock star, you really don't have a lot of portable skills. It becomes sink or swim as a solo artist. Now, there are a number of examples of people who have been thrust down this road, and we're going to begin with Chris Cornell. When Soundgarden decided to call it a day with a sudden announcement on April 9th of 1997, fans were kind of stunned. After all, Soundgarden had been one of the best and one of the biggest bands of the grunge era. And as soon as the press release came out, people started speculating about what was going to come next, especially with Chris. I mean, it somehow seemed logical that he would be the one to somehow carry on. The first thing he did was take a little time off. And then, over the course of about 18 months, he put together a solo record with help from some friends from a band called Eleven. Then, on September 21st, 1999, Chris released a record called Euphoria Morning. This was definitely a rock record, but it was not the same slab of sludge metal that we got from Soundgarden. It was, dare we say it, a rather mature CD featuring some sounds and textures that we never really heard with Soundgarden. Critically, it was very well received. Here's a sample. It's a lead-off track. It's called Can't Change Me. Chris Cornell from that brief solo period after Soundgarden and before Audio Slave. Okay, maybe we should fill in that timeline a little bit better. Euphoria Morning comes out in September 1999. There's a solo tour. There was a remix on the Mission Impossible 2 soundtrack. Then there was a period of domesticity. Chris settled down with his wife, had a baby, and just hung out. And then the phone rang. On the other end was guitarist Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine. Zach, Rage's singer, had decided to leave. However, the other three guys, Tom, Timmy, and Brad, decided that they really wanted to stay together. And they were kind of wondering, you know, if, like, Chris would be interested in being, you know, Zach's replacement in Rage. Now, Chris thought this sounded pretty good, so they convened to write some songs, and that worked out really well, and Chris joined Rage Against the Machine. Now, I actually have a bootleg that's labeled as Rage Against the Machine, but with Chris Cornell on vocals. Somewhere along the line, and I'm not really sure why, there was a collective decision to jettison the Rage name in favor of Audio Slave, which is where we are today. Of course, there was also a second Chris Cornell solo album, but you know what? Sometimes you got to do what you got to do, and you got to do it on your own. Okay, let's back up just a bit and talk about Zach from Rage. Now, he left the band over a creative dispute, maybe a political dispute. 
he wanted to take the band in one direction while the other guys didn't want to go there. So he went solo, or at least he tried to. It's just that we haven't heard much from him at all. Zach participated in a documentary entitled Children of the Revolution, and there have been solo gigs in places like L.A. and Santiago, Chile. But what about an actual solo record? Now, I know for a fact that he worked on an album with Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails. There may have been up to 20 songs recorded for this CD, but as Trent told me directly, and I quote, that album will never see the light of day. In fact, let me give the rest of the quote from Trent. Over time, I think it was a matter of Zach not knowing what direction to go. I know the feeling of fear. He's in a difficult position of leaving one of the best bands of the 90s, and he wants to make an important statement when he makes it. And he will when he gets around to making it. Now, there have been signs of life. Let me play a quick sample. This is a track called We Want It All, which was quietly released as a single in October of 2004. Would you like to hear this? Of course you do. This is Solo Zach from the fall of 2004. So I lined up to kill the desert slums for all that boil beneath the desert sun. Now we speak flame, flip this game. All the targets are taking aim. All targets are taking aim. Zach De La Roca with a song called We Want It All. There's the song. Still no album, though. Here's a guy that's also spent a lot of time lost at sea since the breakup of his band, Billy Corgan. While the Smashing Pumpkins were together, Billy pretty much ran it as a dictatorship. It was his band, his songs. But by the end of 2000, things had deteriorated to the point where it was time to call it a day. So the band played one last show and broke up. Billy's next project was Zwan, a group that also featured Pumpkins drummer Jimmy Chamberlain. Zwan, however, lasted exactly one album before they fell apart. And with nothing else to do, Billy and Jimmy both released solo projects. Jimmy's album came out in January 2005 and was issued under the name The Jimmy Chamberlain Complex. It was called Life Begins Again. And you know something? It's not a bad record. Billy Corgan also released a solo record. It came out on June 21st, 2005, and was entitled The Future Embrace, and remind a lot of old school fans of the Pumpkins' Adore album from 1998. Uh, oh, you didn't know there was a Billy Corgan solo album. Oh. Well, okay, don't worry, because, well, you're not alone. It just kind of disappeared. Here's a sample, though. And if you happen to be a fan of the Bee Gees, pre-Saturday Night Fever Bee Gees, you might even recognize the song. It's a cover of a 1967 Bee Gees hit called To Love Somebody. You don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like. To love somebody. To love somebody. The way I love you. To love somebody. Billy Corgan with To Love Somebody. The Bee Gees song, it's a cover, from his official solo album from the summer of 2005. Now this is just my opinion, but if I had to choose between Billy's solo record and the one put out by Jimmy Chamberlain, who was a Pumpkins drummer, uh, I, would, I would go with Jimmy. The chief songwriter for 99% of Depeche Mode's existence has been Martin Gore. If you care to check the credits on pretty much every album from A Broken Frame in 1982 to the present, you'll see that it's been pretty much all about Martin. Now, if you're singer Dave Gone, you might be happy to sing all of Martin's songs, collect the royalty checks, and just shut up. But after Dave's recovery and resurrection following a series of near-death experiences in the 1990s, he thought, you know, maybe it's time I tested myself in a positive way and recorded my own album with my own songs. The thought of doing it all really kind of freaked him out. But thanks to a friend named Knox Chandler, who helped and coached him, a record slowly came together. And by June 3rd, 2003, it was ready. 
Dave released an album called Paper Monsters. It was his first solo project in 22 years with Depeche Mode. And it's surprisingly solid. It's not too far away from Depeche Mode territory, but you really wouldn't expect it to be, right? Try this. The song is called Hold On. Dave Gunn, singer for Depeche Mode, with a song called Hold On from a solo record called Paper Monsters. Took him 22 years to get around to it, but at least he did it, right? Sometimes the decision to go solo is an easy one. Your band is done. Or maybe you get kicked out of your band. What else are you going to do except maybe get a job at the drive-thru? Sometimes the solo decision isn't so easy. There's a lot of agonizing involved, not to mention some ego issues involved on both sides of the equation. And then there are the people who just go off and do their thing, get it out of their system, and then come back to the fold. John Frusciante of the Red Hot Chili Peppers is a good example. Same thing with Tom York of Radiohead. Whatever the cause and case and motivation, it can work out. Morrissey has done extremely well after the Smiths imploded. Then, though, his songwriting partner, Johnny Marr, hasn't done quite as well. He's had a terrific career as a session player, but as a solo dude, like a strictly solo dude, eh, not so much. And sometimes we find that the whole is actually greater than the sum of its parts. Take the case of the Stone Roses, an awesome unit when they were together. But when you split up singer Ian Brown and guitarist John Squire, again, you know, not so much. Both have had extremely spotty solo careers and certainly nothing approaching what the Roses were in the early 1990s. Jerry Cantrell of Alice in Chains? You know, had some decent solo records, but nothing anywhere near the order of what Alice accomplished together. And has anyone heard from Scott Stapp? Tens of millions of records were sold when he was the singer with Creed. Not a lot of singles sold as a solo artist. And it hasn't been any better with his former bandmates. Their post-Creed group is called Alter Bridge and, uh, well, underwhelming, you know? There are more stories. But you know what? We'll leave those for another time. In fact, if you have any suggestions about people going solo and the things that happen to them, send them to me. We'll cover them off next time. Now, this is not a solo effort. I've got Rob Johnston over there doing all the technical production. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 